What's up, my friend? My name is Ted Rice, and you're listening to the Legendary Life Podcast. As you know, my wife and I have been traveling the world for the past year. Today, I'm coming to you from Chiang Mai, Thailand, where I've been for the past four months, but I only have a week to go because in a week, I'm going to be going to Bali, Indonesia, and I'm super excited to go there to eat some Jajan Pasar and to watch some Balinese Lagong dances and all the incredible offerings that Bali has to share. And I can't wait to share it with you. But right now, I've got a week left here. Super excited to bring today's episode to you. This might be the last episode I do before I get on that plane to a new exotic destination in Southeast Asia. So today I've got Stefan Guillenet. And Stefan, if you don't know, he's a neurobiologist who's, who's, uh, who specializes in studying obesity, what causes obesity. And very recently, he went on the Joe Rogan show to debate Gary Tobbs. And if you don't know who Gary Tobbs is, Gary wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories. He's written a bunch of other books. And he went on to debate Gary about the true cause of obesity. Now, I'll tell you, Gary is the smartest person I've ever talked to when it comes to understanding the mechanisms driving the obesity epidemic in the modern world. And we get into not only some of that stuff, because I've covered it in previous episodes, just go to legendarylightpodcast.com and you can listen to my previous episodes with Stefan Guinet. But today we're going to get into some philosophical discussions too. We're going to talk about why things like this are happening, why a guy like Gary, who is a journalist, is able to challenge people like Stefan who have a PhD and have done their due diligence, have done their work, have put in the effort to get their PhD uh, and have conducted scientific research and have a really good understanding of it. And we also talk about why other medical doctors and people with PhDs kind of share opinions and viewpoints on nutrition and health that aren't popular. So we get into all that and more. So what I'm trying to get at here is if you are a bit confused, you don't know who to believe when it comes to what you should eat, why people are getting overweight, why we're dealing with such an obesity crisis right now, you're going to learn a lot. And I'm so happy with the way this episode turned out. That's why I'm so excited to bring it to you because we get into more of this discussion about how to think about the information that we're all inundated with. So you're going to learn a lot about that and more. I know you're going to love this episode as much as I did. So let's get to the interview with Stefan Guinet. Stefan Guinet, thanks so much for coming back on. Yeah, good to be here, Ted. Yeah. And last time you were here, we talked about food addiction. We talked about the changes in the brain that occur when we, when, when our ancient brains come into contact with these modern hyper palatable foods. It was such a great conversation, but this time I'd like to take a different approach because I had the good fortune of getting you on my show as you were going to uh, just, a, I guess, a, a couple of weeks before you're going to get on to Joe Rogan's podcast and debate Gary Tobbs. And I'd like to dive into that a little bit, Stefan, because we're in a very interesting time right now where a neuroscientist, a guy with a PhD, in other words, you are going on a show um, that's become one of the biggest platforms around for people to get their information from, uh, nutrition and otherwise, really. And you're debating a guy who's got a best-selling book, who's a, a science journalist. I mean, it's just a weird situation. Why aren't you debating another scientist, right? And um, can, can I just ask you, how do you feel about that situation? And I mean, what is your perspective around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean... I think it's a reflection of the current media environment and just general cultural climate in this country right now. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to say that, you know, science 
scientists have exclusive access to the truth and no one else does. I, you know, I don't think anyone would make that argument, but I mean, certainly I think it's self-evident that, uh, you know, a scientist is generally going to have more expertise in the thing that he studies than someone who is not a scientist and doesn't study that thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, and this goes back hundreds of years in the United States. This is not exclusive to the 21st century, but we kind of have this culture in the United States of self-reliance. You know, that's, that's a very um, core cultural trait in the United States of self-reliance. And we, you know, part of that is feeling like we can figure anything out. And, you know, just because someone has you know, gone to school and studied something for many years and then spent, you know, most of their life doing full-time research on it, that does not really qualify someone to have a greater level of expertise than a person who just kind of mucks around on the internet and thinks about stuff in his spare time. And so I think that's kind of the cultural perspective, <clears throat> perspective that we have right now that allows uh, a person like Gary to be put on a platform that's equal to or higher than the platform that we put researchers on in terms of respecting expertise and listening to what they have to say. Um, so that's kind of like, I would say that's kind of like the negative perspective on it. I would say that there's also a positive perspective on it. And that is that, you know, I think that there are some things that he's saying that are right too, you know, like he, is saying, hey, this low carbohydrate diet, it's not going to kill you. Maybe it will help you. And there are some people that were kind of saying that it would kill you. And I think that he's on the right side of that argument and people are trying to diet and they're not dropping dead and they're losing weight and their health is improving. And so they're saying, you know, this guy must be right and everybody else is wrong. So I would say that's kind of like the positive um, way to look at it. But yeah, I mean, I think if I were having a debate with a scientist, it would either not be a debate or it would be a very different type of debate. I think there's really not a lot of scientists who I would have like large beefs with that I would even want to do a debate like this with. It's only someone, the only way I would want to have this kind of debate is with someone who I'm fairly confident is wrong. <laughs> that's that's funny yeah and uh well uh, interesting answer well well stated i would add something to that as well it definitely means something if someone has a, an, an md after their name or a phd it definitely means they've uh you know gone through this qualification process in school and advanced education it, it means a lot uh, but we're in also a strange time in our culture in that sometimes it still doesn't mean that they're right. Uh, case in point, uh, Jason Fung talking about fasting. I, I think he's changed his tune a little bit. And maybe that would have been a better person to, to or, or if we wanted a more scientific debate, that different type of a debate that you were talking about. So he promotes fasting and talks about like the hormonal benefits of fasting, the norepinephrine, the growth hormone that gets released and the low insulin that um, accelerates fat loss faster than would a, a typical deficit done without fasting. And, um, maybe you have some different even opinions about that, but I, I want to just briefly share a story where a client of mine, uh, one of my earlier clients came on and said, Ted, you're, you're telling me that, you know, it's just about the, the calorie deficit and keeping your protein at a certain amount and doing a, a program, a, a resistance training program with progressive overload. And th this doctor came on and said, the opposite that you're saying with nutrition, how can I listen to you over a doctor? And what I said was, well, look at what they're writing and the, look at the papers they're referencing. There's 
some doctors who do the research, right? Some PhDs and MDs as well. But a lot of us are getting the information from the same place. And if you're getting the wrong information or, or making, um, or if you're extrapolating things from the research that you're getting, but not really thinking critically about it, for example, like all the low carb research that was done, but didn't equate protein, right? So you, I could say low carb diets are superior. Look at the lo, the results of this study. And so, well, that, that that person ate a lot more protein. That's going to change everything, and has very little to do with the low carbohydrate or versus low fat. It had more to do with the protein. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or what, what are your, yeah. Per, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think there's a big difference. People who are not researchers can be obviously well-educated on these topics, but I think the problem comes when you want to go rogue and you want to say, hey, I may not have you know, the research background in this. I may not have been studying this for you know, decades, but I think all these guys that have been doing that are wrong and <laughs> and then you go to the public and make those kinds of statements. I mean, I think that's when you start to in your best selling book, right? Yeah. And I think <laughs> that's when you start to run into hot water. And, you know, if you're an educated lay person and you have beliefs that are consistent with a lot of the most educated people in the world on those topics, you don't, that's not the situation that should be raising concern. The situation raising concern that should be raising concern is when your opinion differs substantially from the most knowledgeable people in the world. And, um, and, you know, of course, the most knowledgeable people in the world could be wrong true too. You know, I'm not saying that they are never wrong. They could be wrong for a number of reasons, including stubbornness and bias and whatever. So it's not that they're never wrong, but I think that if you really think you're right and you really think they are wrong, uh, I think it should at a minimum lead to some serious soul searching uh, that maybe you're not as right as you think you are, because that's usually what ends up being the case. And, you know, I think uh, the case of Jason Fung is an interesting one, too, to to examine more closely, because he is trained as a nephrologist, a kidney doctor. So he's not an expert in obesity. He's not anyone who's done research on the mechanisms that underlie body fatness, underlie diabetes, underlie cardiovascular disease. So really, I mean, he, he has an education in the fundamentals. Of course, he, I'm sure he knows a lot about, you know, anatomy and I'm sure he's gone through all of the like biochem and organic chemistry and things that doctors go through. So I'm sure he has a lot of fundamental medical knowledge like any doctor would, but that doesn't make him, that doesn't make him an expert in the mechanisms of obesity or diabetes. It makes him an expert in um, working with patients, particularly from a nephrology perspective, which is what he specializes in. So um, I think that's yet another case of someone kind of uh, attacking the research community from a position of less knowledge than the research community is in. So it's not actually that different than someone without an MD making those same claims. Now, if he was an obesity researcher, then I would feel differently about that. I would say maybe we need to look at this more seriously. But yeah, so I, I guess I would say that he's maybe like halfway there, but he's not all the way there in terms of having that high level of expertise that you would want to have in someone who's kind of like trying to overturn the kind of majority opinion on some of these matters. Yeah, I hear that. I've got a question. It's not really a personal question, but I guess it's about your personal views. Are, are the, some of these people, are they lying or are they just, um, obviously you don't know the answer to that in terms of like, you don't know what's in their mind, even though you're a neuroscientist, a neurobiologist, Stefan, but uh, are these people lying or are they just really into their own beliefs, into their own confirmation bias? Yeah, I mean, I really don't know. Like you said, I can't see what's going on inside people's heads, and I try not to make any assumptions about what's going on inside people's heads. Um, I, you know, I certainly see uh, some pretty remarkable levels of bias 
Uh, but whether that is inadvertent or deliberate, I, I really can't speculate on that. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, it's something I wonder about sometimes. And I feel like uh, sometimes we have to ask that question. So also I will say this, I'm into getting my name out there, into marketing and branding myself. And I see these guys, they form like, um, you know, like uh, partnerships and and they all uh, sort of promote each other. And uh, there is a strong financial incentive to to keep going with what you're doing, especially when it's working. Um, Even, yeah, I, I don't know whether they're lying or not either. Stefan, but it is an interesting situation that we're in. And that's why so many people who listen to my podcast come to this podcast to kind of get the truth, uh, or at least closer to the truth, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a tough position for a lot of people to be in, especially when they hear doctors talking about something that, um, you know, talking about how it's really carbohydrates that are driving obesity versus anything else. And um, they, they don't know what to think. So one of the yeah, things that I, I, I want to... I just want to... Sorry. I'm yeah, of course. Real quick here that, I mean, throughout American history, there has been so much bull crap promoted by doctors. <laughs> and I'm not saying that most doctors are like that at all. I'm, right. not, I'm not trying to insult doctors in general. But I mean, there have been a lot of kind of rogue doctors throughout American history that have promoted some absolutely ridiculous nonsense. And I don't think that has ended today. Just to give you an example, I, I read uh, this book, Grain Brain, by uh, Perlmutter. I forget his first name. Um, oh, yeah, David Perlmutter. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy He's is, one of the ones in the, the, the group that all promotes the same okay. people. Yeah, he's like a media sensation. I mean, I, 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 yeah. there was like, I was flipping through channels one time when I was visiting my parents and he was having this like hour long infomercial promoting his DVDs and stuff. He has like, I mean, this is like an empire. It's like a financial empire. It's really (laughs) impressive. And the guy is incredibly, uh, he's incredibly, um, eloquent. Well, (laughs) eloquent, but he's very eloquent and persuasive. When you hear him talk, he's, he's incredibly charismatic. That's the word I'm looking for. He's very Mm. charismatic person. He's, he could have been a preacher, I think, in a, in a different life. But he, I mean, he makes some claims in that book that are just like head-scratchingly ridiculous. Like uh, there's one claim that our the diet of our ancestors was, I think he says, like 5% carbohydrate, uh, 80% fat, and 15% protein. No citation. Whoa. Yeah, no citation, just... Hey, the the general diet of all of our ancestors looked like this, um, and that was kind of like his part of his rationale for recommending that kind of a diet for us now. And then also there was the claim that the U.S. diet was lower in carbohydrate and higher in fat 100 years ago, which is actually the opposite of what it actually was. Uh, so this this kind of stuff has always existed and has always been promoted by doctors. Uh, at least, you know, a small fraction of doctors that, you know, I don't know what their reasoning is in their head, but uh, certainly it benefits them a lot financially. And yeah, I think it is a really big problem because these are people who have credibility by virtue of their medical degree or, you know, and it's not just doctors. I shouldn't blame this all on doctors. There's scientists who do this too. There's, you know, in any profession, anybody who ever worked for NASA too has like instant credibility and can say whatever like BS they want. Um, So like, yeah, there are these labels that give people credibility and they can be abused. And again, I'm not saying that people are deliberately abusing them. I, I really don't know what's going through their heads, but certainly, you know, promoting viewpoints that are not very evidence based and doing harm to public health as a result of having that credibility built in with their, uh, their degree. Yeah. I mean, how do you eat 80% fat if you're in Africa, you know, like the Hadza, maybe if you're an Inuit and eating whale blubber, but that just doesn't make sense. Um, just in terms of the geography for a lot of 
indigenous cultures it's like when you get that much fat naturally exactly with that ratio of carbohydrate to protein come on it's completely (laughs) completely implausible and i mean even the inuit yeah they probably would have eaten like that during some seasons but not year round Uh, i think for a lot of the year they were eating uh, more protein and less fat than that and they also ate some plant foods you know so i think uh yeah, it's it's just absolutely completely implausible and there's no evidence to support it. So it's just like why did you write it? I don't know yeah. the answer to that question. Yeah, it would be interesting. Unfortunately, um, I probably won't ever get the cuz if I ever got those guys on that's what I would be asking them and um you know, I don't think that's going to go down too well. Um maybe maybe not. We'll see. But that's the ty- those are the types of questions that I have uh, for those people. I, I, there's another one who talks about the damaging properties of uh, dietary lectins and why we shouldn't be eating uh, <laughs> too many. Yeah, gundry. And, yeah, yeah, him. And uh, man, it just uh, it gets really confusing for people. I will say this though, Stefan. Um, there's a lot of loss of trust in experts, uh, or at least mainstream experts, um, especially when they're, when they're not so eloquent with making their cases. I think the whole thing that we're seeing with vaccinations right now with the public being very wary or, or a, a substantial percentage of the public being very wary about vaccinations in spite of like all the evidence to the contrary, um, but I think partly it's uh, the mainstream, it's the mainstream establishment that has kind of cut the or created that re- negative relationship as a whole. Where it's uh, you even hear some of the people criticize some of the studies. It's like, well, who are they paid by? Well, yeah. It's like, well, of course, every study has to be paid for with someone by someone. It doesn't necessarily negate the uh, the, the validity of a study. Uh, yeah. Depending on who paid for it, even if it's a little, sh- even if you could say it's a little shady, it, it doesn't necessarily negate it. Even um, yeah, you know. I agree with that. I mean, if you can't find a problem, a specific problem that makes you think that those researchers were biased as a result of the funding source, then I just don't think you have much of a case. And I mean, I think when people make these kinds of claims, you often you should examine the person making the claim first because often they have massive conflicts of interest. And I think these types of conflicts of interest, you know, you see journalists like Gary Taubes and Nina Teicholz and people like that, they kind of style themselves as these, you know, independent uh, thinkers who are pointing out conflicts of interest in others, but they have a massive conflict of interest. I mean, their entire success of their careers depends on continuing to promote these controversial ideas to the public. And so, I mean, I think conflict of interest is something that can apply to anyone. It can be very insidious. And yes, it definitely is something that is concerning in the scientific community and in scientific research. I'm not trying to minimize that in any way, but at least in science, there are, there are systems in place to control conflicts of interest. If you're looking outside of science, if you're looking at the publishing industry or in the food industry or places like that, there's no controls in place. There's no guardrails there to protect uh, the audience against bias arising from conflicts of interest. And so I think, uh, yeah, I guess I find it a little humorous when uh, the pot calls the kettle black in in situations like that. Um, I mean, that said, you know, I think it's obviously not irrational to, to worry about where a study's funding source comes from. You know, there is some concern there that should be, that should exist, but I think people blow it out of proportion and they kind of use it as a cudgel. What I see most often is people will use that argument only on studies that return findings they don't like. Right. So they'll say, <laughs> Oh, you know, this is paid for by, I don't know, big something, big meat or big, sugar or whatever. But then when a study that was funded by an industry they like comes out, then 
nobody really talks about the conflict of interest there. So you see a lot of that. And actually, this is something that I see a lot in, uh, in, in Gary's writing, um, where he'll, you know, write chapters and chapters about the conflicts of interest of people who were not anti-sugar back in the, you know, 50s through 70s and 80s, people who thought fat was more of a problem than sugar, but then won't talk about the massive conflicts of interest of the people who were saying that really the problem was sugar and not fat. Like John Yudkin probably had bigger conflicts of interest than anyone else that Gary has ever written about. And yet there's not a word about that in his, in his books. I mean, he was massively on the payroll of meat and dairy and other uh, higher fat animal food industry um, to kind of do what he did um, to publicly attack sugar. So um, yeah, anyway, it cuts both, it cuts, cuts both ways on that. Let's, uh, let's give the benefit of the doubt to, to everyone we're speaking about and just say it's these cognitive biases that they have, right? And we can even tease out, uh, we can even say even before they started getting financial success, they had to do this thing, right? Promote this certain viewpoint. Um, is there a, a neurobiological reason you can share with us that uh, this type of thing happens even with some of the most brightest, smartest, most educated minds? Yeah, I mean, I can't really give you the neuroscience on it, but I mean, certainly, you know, the human brain is not optimized as a truth-seeking organ. The human brain is optimized as a self-interest-seeking organ. And sometimes truth benefits self-interest and sometimes it doesn't. And I think we're very good, the human brain is very good at convincing us that something is true when it's in our self-interest. And so I don't think you have to assume that there's any ill intent uh, when someone, you know, promotes things that are false, I think often maybe they actually believe that thing, you know, and it's just something that kind of on some level, some part of their brain recognized that it would be beneficial to promote this thing. And so they do it. But I, I also, you know, I want to, I don't want to be too hard on Gary or on Jason Fung and those other people here, because you know, I want to acknowledge that there is some benefit that they are bringing. Like a guy like uh, Jason Fung, he's treating patients and probably benefiting them. You know, he's advocating a low carbohydrate dietary approach for diabetes, which I think is a very reasonable thing to do. Um, he is advocating for fasting, which has a long history of usefulness in diabetes management. I think going back like a century maybe even further than that. So, you know, I don't want to like completely say these people are devoid of value, but I just wish that um, some of the stuff that came along with the value was a little bit more evidence-based, I guess, you know, it's like, and I would also say like with, with Dr. Fung, you know, he, he takes a very aggressive attitude toward, you know, trying to quote unquote debunk uh, everything that kind of challenges his beliefs. And uh, he's very quick to say that people who disagree with him um, are liars and scammers, even, you know, mainstream uh, doctors, the people who gave him his medical license, <laughs> his colleagues are, you know, like basically scamming people with diabetes and lying to them. And uh, I guess I wish that we could just have the beneficial parts of what they do without the conspiracy stuff and the hot air associated with it. I appreciate that perspective, especially the fact that you're willing to recognize the value in those people who maybe say and do things that are uh, kind of rub you the wrong way and rub me the wrong way. Um, but they're also, if you look at what they're doing they are bringing value. They're helping people with their lives. I've had Dave Asprey a couple times on this show, not, not in a while because I really, in my search for the truth or scientific objectivity, 
so I could get better results for the, the coaching clients who, you know, pay their hard-earned money and spend their valuable time to work with me. I was curious about what he was up to and I had him on a couple of times. And I got to say, in his case, you know, I really liked the guy. And um, a lot of the people in the evidence-based who, or who would identify <laughs> as evidence-based really, uh, some people reached out to me and uh, not people who really know me or listen to the show very much, but just saw that I had interviewed him and I promoted the interview and, and attacked me for it. And I wanted, I was curious, I wanted to talk to the guy and I ended up talking to him twice. And you know what, Stefan, he was a, he was a nice guy and he's a very successful, financially successful, doing very well, doesn't have to come on this show, you know, uh, and he did it and he was nice to talk to. And I'll tell you, I don't know if you're familiar with the research. I forget the name of the study, but it's basically how negative people in your life, for, for lack of a more scientific uh, criterion, right? But neg- how negative people bring down individuals and also even groups more powerfully than positive individuals do. And I feel like there's a strong negative vibe going on uh, in, in at least the evidence-based health and fitness and nutrition circles that I see. And uh, that's something that I would wish would change about the other side, the side Mm, that mm -hmm. supposedly is on the side of truth. It's like, well, you know, you're not helping your case when you're just busy trolling and not making, not helping your clients as much as you should, or trying to get good information out there, just talking negative about everybody. It's not really helping. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, and I, you know, I wonder sometimes whether I'm falling into that category. I probably do sometimes, but I don't think so. I follow your stuff regularly. I don't think so. All right. Well, I appreciate that. In any case, it's, it's an issue that I'm certainly aware of. Um, and no, I agree with you. I mean, I think there are certain personality types who just love to criticize and, you know, they're not necessarily creating value. They're just, you know, trying to take down things that they perceive as wrong. And I don't know, there's a place for that, I guess. But um, I could see not necessarily wanting to have that be your only source of information. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, um, let's change gears a little bit. And uh, you you mentioned something in, in your website or on your website in one of your articles about how insulin might be related to the effects of fat loss, something that guys like Gary Tobbs have argued with the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. And you think that the the carbohydrate insulin model, the whole idea, in case you're listening right now, you don't know, you haven't heard that term before. It's basically you eat carbs, carbs raise your blood sugar, that raises insulin, insulin makes you store fat. So that's kind of the big deal versus how much total food you eat in terms of how many calories or whatever. Uh, It's really about this, these carbohydrates. And that has proven to be false time and time again. But you had said there might be some hormonal effects specific to insulin that may affect fat loss. Can you talk about that? I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, are you talking about the genetics study, the Mendelian randomization study that uh, David Ludwig was involved in? Or was this just a general comment that I made? Yeah, it was a general comment okay. that yeah. you, okay. you felt there was some... Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. So, I mean, basically, there are many different versions that you could articulate of the insulin obesity hypothesis. And uh, the version that Gary Taubes uh, advocates, which is very similar to the version that David Ludwig advocates, is uh, an extreme version that's like, you know, Carbs raise insulin, it acts directly on fat cells and makes you fat, and that's the primary cause of obesity. So that's like a very strong argument, you know, a very very strong model. You're basically saying this is it, this is what causes obesity. But, I mean, there are a lot of different versions that you could make. So, 
you know, insulin does a lot of things in the body and insulin resistance changes a lot of things. So there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, one of those things to have something to do with obesity. And, um, one, you know, one thing that would immediately make the hypothesis more plausible is if you were, instead of saying, Hey, this is the cause of obesity. If you were to say, Hey, this is one contributing factor, because if you tell me that, this factor accounts for 10% of variation in body fatness between individuals, that's a lot harder to refute than the hypothesis that it accounts for 95% of the differences in body fat between individuals. You know, if, if you're saying it's 95%, you better have a pretty damn ironclad evidence to support, to support your hypothesis. If you're saying it's 10%, then it's not very easy to refute at that point, and it's also not that easy to detect. So you could say, well, maybe we just haven't detected the effect yet. Um, so that's one way in which it could be more plausible. And then there are, uh, and that's not my preferred way, but I'm just acknowledging that that's a possibility. So like if Gary came out tomorrow and said, okay, yeah, calories matter. I just think in the long term, maybe insulin kind of boosts fat gain a little bit. That would be something where I'd be like, okay, that doesn't piss me off because it's at least it's not obviously wrong. <laughs> um, and but uh, there are other, other possibilities. So you know we have these circuits in our brains that regulate body fatness and appetite, and these circuits respond both to signals from inside the body and signals from outside the body to set your appetite and your uh, preferred level of body fatness. And one of the most powerful signals that we probably talked about last time, maybe we did, I don't, I don't remember, is leptin. And, but another signal is insulin. And insulin, the effects of insulin on the brain and on appetite and body fat regulation were actually known even before we discovered leptin. And that was some of the work that my mentor, Mike Schwartz, was intimately involved in. So if you take some insulin and you inject it into the brain, animals will eat less and they will lose fat if you do it chronically. So there are receptors that are in some of these same parts of the brain that respond to this other hormone leptin. And insulin is kind of like leptin's kid brother. It uh, mildly suppresses appetite and food intake. However, if you become insulin resistant, then that insulin cannot exert its effect like it once did. And so if those circuits suddenly aren't responding to that insulin very well because you've become insulin resistant, then maybe you're going to lose that appetite suppressing effect and you're going to have a hard time controlling your appetite and your, and your body fatness. So I would say, you know, that's certainly a way in which, in which the hypothesis could be, could be plausible as well. And that would be like, the version, you know, if I had to like pick one version that I find the most plausible, that would be it. But again, it's, I really would have a hard time believing that that would be the primary driver, but could be a contributor. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, as I mentioned before, there are many different things that insulin does, many things that insulin resistance changes in the body. And so there are potentially a million things that could relate to obesity, but there's just not a lot of very strong evidence right now that any of them are playing a major role. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I'm glad we got into that, but that was more for the people who are maybe falling or getting seduced by this idea of like, oh, weight loss is all about hormones. It's like, yeah, well, if that's the case, it's about insulin and leptin and how that affects your behavior, but it's not directly related to whether you lose fat or not. Right. So, um, yeah. So, and also, yeah, I, you know, go I, for it. one other thing I want to clarify is that a lot of people, you know, the idea of hormones being in control is this very seductive idea that's like very intuitively plausible and hormones obviously are important, but I think, uh, what some people haven't been queued up to is that, hormones are only one avenue for physiological regulation. And they are an important avenue, but the nervous system is another very important avenue. And we know that the brain regulates a lot of physiology. 
you know, it has nerves going everywhere. It regulates body fatness. It regulates your blood pressure. It regulates your digestion, your body temperature. So a lot of physiology in your body is being regulated directly by your brain through nerve impulses, not through hormones necessarily. Um, and that is a major avenue of physiological regulation. And so I think hormones clearly are important, but I think we can't lay everything at the feet of hormones. That's not how the body works. Yeah, and uh, uh, Minso, Minso, Minno Henselman's actually put forth like a, a an interesting idea uh, and backed it up with quite a bit of research. Is that if you want to optimize your hormones, you lose fat the way pretty much every bodybuilder and every dieter and everybody, you know, who's uh, uh, successfully lost fat, you, you lose fat. In other words, you lose fat to optimize your hormones or uh, you address your sleep to optimize your hormones um, or your cravings. Right. And um, it's just not, uh, it's just not as sexy and seductive to talk about it like that. Could you talk a little bit about the other things? I mean, we, we dove into addiction last time, talked a, a fair bit about it. It was fascinating discussion. And I'll make sure the link to that episode is, is up on the show notes for this, uh, for this interview. In, a, in addition to the first time you've been on the show, this is actually your third time. But the idea that there are these other things that make us eat more. Can you, can you talk a little bit about stress eating and what, what the neuroscience says about that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at surveys conducted by the American Psychological Association on stress, these surveys are called uh, Stress in America. What they report is that a lot of people overeat when they feel stressed. And it's, not, it's actually not universal. Some people undereat, some people overeat, but more people tend to overeat than undereat. And that's particularly true for women, actually. Women are more susceptible, on average, than men uh, to stress overeating. And yeah, so this is, this is a big deal. So why do we do that? Um, there are probably a couple different reasons. One of them is this hormone cortisol where once uh, your brain detects stress, there's this kind of cascade of uh, nerve impulses that end in your um, adrenal glands and start producing cortisol. And cortisol goes back to the brain then and it kind of dampens some of these circuits that regulate body fatness and appetite and makes them favor a higher appetite and higher body fatness. And so you see this in people who take cortisol as a drug. Cortisol is an incredibly powerful anti-inflammatory drug. And I should say, you know, it's not literally cortisol. It's drugs that act on the cortisol receptors. And it's an incredibly powerful anti-inflammatory drug. And so it's used when necessary medically. But uh, when you give people this drug, it makes them gain fat and particularly around the midsection. And it really screws up their metabolism, so it brings them closer toward a diabetic uh, state. And uh, it's you know the evidence I would say is not ironclad on this, but it seems like the amount of cortisol that is released during everyday stress is enough to kind of push us in that direction. And we see this in observational studies too. People who experience a lot of job-related stress tend to gain more weight over time, tend to have higher rates of diabetes, tend to have higher cardiovascular disease rates. Um, it's really uh, not good. And we see this in primate experiments too. Um, I wrote about some of those in my book as well. And so that's one way that it can happen. And there's another way too, which is that stress makes us want to eat comfort foods. And comfort foods tend to be calorie-dense, refined foods that are more fattening than the types of foods that uh, we might normally consume. And so um, the interesting thing about that is that it actually dampens the brain circuits that promote stress. And so these, uh, you know, this nerve activity, the neuron activity in your 
amygdala and other parts of your brain that mediate these stress responses actually is dampened, at least animal research suggests this, is dampened by eating really tasty food. And it's kind of interesting. You can do it with sugar, you can do it with fat, and you can do it with sex. So it doesn't even have to be food. And again, this comes from animal experiments. So they had, I guess, mice and rats humping to see what would happen in in the brain um, during stress. But uh, so it's not exclusive to food. So basically anything that makes you feel good dampens the stress response. So it's not just comfort food. It's comfort anything, you know, a bubble bath, going for a walk, calling a friend, going for a bike ride, having sex, whatever it is that you enjoy. Um, and I would argue that a lot of those other activities are probably more constructive than eating comfort food. But obviously comfort food is particularly seductive because it's easy, you know, like yeah. you, you know, if, if you went for a jog, you'd probably feel a lot better, but that requires, you know, clearing this effort barrier eating comfort food does not require clearing an effort barrier. It actually is effortful to not eat delicious food, you know? So it's like pleasurable to eat it and it relieves your stress and it doesn't require any effort. So that's uh, pretty tough to compete with, I would say, um, from other types of natural rewards. But uh, I don't know. I mean, even if you can just get partial relief by going outside or taking a bath or you know, calling a friend, I, I still think that might be enough to uh, stave off some of the unhealthy food consumption. Yeah, g- great points, Stefan. It makes me think about some of the clients that I've worked with and some of the stories that I've heard from people who listen to the show. It, uh, I had a client once tell me, he's like, I don't have a lot of pleasure in my life. And food is one of those sources. It's one of the few sources of pleasure. And so a big part of the coaching was trying to help him uh, facilitate other, like better connections with people, better, uh, more of a community of friends, um, other things that he was into to give him pleasure in his life so that he wouldn't turn to food. Uh, and, and I'm thinking you you mentioned sex. And like you said, there's this barrier of effort and there's, there's a barrier of effort in terms of the effort that it takes to go for a jog or to even pick up your cell phone and call your, your family or friends uh, versus just run to the refrigerator and reach for the, the chocolate cake or the ice cream in the freezer. But there's also a situation where a lot of people um, have these tough lives where they have kids, they're you know sacrificing themselves in, in part for the kids, taking them places, making sure they're, the kids are on point with what they need to do to excel in life. And then they work these jobs with uh, long hours and Maybe they don't get to see their partner as much or they've started putting on weight over the years. And now that they look at each other and it's like, "Mm, you know, sex or chocolate cake, Mm, you know, we're (laughs) kind of older, we're a few pounds heavier, I'm not so attracted to you. And, you know, that chocolate cake, uh, let's just, you know, let's have some Netflix and watch some Netflix and and eat some food (laughs) instead of doing these other things that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I I recognize that it's challenging. You know, I, I don't have an easy answer for that at all. Um, all I will say is that I think it's worth trying to make the effort because ultimately regularly indulging in comfort food is destructive. And, you know, it's worth at least trying to find other ways to either manage that stress or maybe if you're able to reduce the stress, even just making a plan to think about how you can address the stress, uh, you know, even just having a plan, even if you don't even successfully execute it, having a plan makes you feel more in control. And the worst type of stress is uncontrollable stress. That's the kind that has the greatest physiological and psychological response. And so even if you can make yourself, you know, if you can get control, that's the best. But even if you can just make yourself feel like you're getting control, that even is valuable. But yeah, I mean, like I said, it's 
it's not an easy problem to solve. And I don't pretend to have simple, easy solutions. But I do think that if you're someone where that's your where that's a major sticking point for you in terms of your weight and health, it's certainly worth examining strategies to address it. Yeah, uh, well said. I guess that, well, that's uh, spoken like a true researcher. And I guess that's the the other side where we need kind of the people like me to to go and work with individuals and, and coach them um, past these these issues. Stefan, I, I have one, actually two more questions. One big question, then it's just a final parting question. Uh, do you have time for those? Yeah. Cool. So the something I've been thinking about a lot, Stefan, is what it takes to make a breakthrough in someone's life. And when I say that, I think immediately, at least I do any, anyway, about the brain and the experiences that cause us to create a permanent shift in our behavior or shift in our perspective to where we end up living lives differently. I mean, it could be, um, you know, a death in the family. It, change happens so quick. You don't have to think about how you feel about that search situation. It just hits you hard. And I think the same is also true when you find the right positive situation. And um, from the I hesitate to call it research, but from the reading that I've done and from some of the studies that I've looked at, it seems that this idea of embodied learning um, is really important. Uh, This idea that even though I love having these conversations with people like you, Stefan, people who listen to them, it's not going to create a big emotional charge in them. Maybe they enjoy listening to it. Maybe they go to work feeling all pumped up, but then they get sucked into their daily life. And just that energy that listening to this podcast created is gone. Another thing that I saw is um, for for learning to take place. And I learned this from, um, from books talking about how to speak better, which is when, and, and we've talked about dopamine in, in this, in the, uh, arena of food addiction and and food cravings last time when you were here, but also experiences that create a high amount of dopamine can lead to changes, can lead to state change that may lead to a behavior change later. Can you, um, do you have any thoughts on that? What it takes to create new habits or to create a breakthrough in someone's life? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a good question and it's an important question. You know, how the the bigger question, I guess, is how do you motivate someone to make lasting positive changes? And, you know, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to say that I, this is not really something that I know that much about. It's more a matter of psychology than neuroscience, I would say. And I'm not a psychologist, but I'll, I'll simply agree with you that it's an important question, but I think I'll have to leave that to other folks. Okay, I appreciate that, man. You know, staying within your 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 boundaries there. I appreciate that. Um, you you don't even have anything like personal that you could share. Uh, not off the top of my head, no. All right. Um, so, man, I really enjoyed this conversation a lot. It took a really different, really different traje- trajectory than um, what we spoke about last time. And I think it's an important conversation that needs to be had. And uh, man, just really psyched that we're able to hop on before your Joe Rogan experience. And uh, with Gary Taubes, I guess the thing that I'd like to ask you is, what is the one thing that you want people to take away from your interview today? And um, what you're trying to do with going on Joe Rogan and, and to debate this guy who you think is just, you know, 90% wrong? I guess maybe the most important thing that we talked about today is this general principle that we live in a cultural and media environment that does not really respect expertise. And, um, you know, it's not limited to the health and nutrition world. We see this in politics. Um, we see it all over the place in the kind of like post-truth attitude that we have in a lot of uh, information that surrounds us in this country. And so I think just kind of recognizing that and 
allowing it to inform our attitudes going forward, I think is, is, is important. Um, as far as my debate with Gary, you know, I want to show very clearly that his idea is incorrect. And um, I think there's a lot of evidence that supports my position on that, and I'll be citing that evidence. Uh, but more than that, I also want to present an alternative. You know, I want to present my alternative, which is the one that the most of the scientific community believes in and the one that doesn't get a lot of airtime in uh, the type of large media platforms that Gary usually is able to uh, command. And so I think, you know, kind of showing people, oh, hey, the researchers, maybe they're not just all idiots, like Gary would say. <laughs> um, maybe they actually have a point, And maybe we should think twice before swallowing uh, hook, line, and sinker the stories of folks like Gary. Gotcha. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Really looking forward to see it. Um, the uh, time difference, I'm still in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and I'll be in Southeast Asia probably for another few months. So I'll have to catch it on the replay, but uh, really looking forward to that. And, and Stefan, man, thanks for being you. Thanks for being, you're, you're one of my favorite people to speak to and to learn from because you have this, this very balanced, what I feel is a very balanced uh, position where you're able to see the good, the bad, you're able to, you know, tease things out and not get, you know, you're passionate about what you do, but you're, you're able to control your emotions. So you don't end up sounding like, uh, some of the people who were trying to, you know, get people away from, right. Thanks so much for coming on today and sharing your, your, your wisdom again, and most importantly, spending your time with the listeners. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And is uh, I'll have all the links to your websites and all your book and everything. Is there anywhere else where you'd like people to go? I know you're quite active on the Twitter. Yeah, Twitter is really the main place where I'm putting out information right now. So um, a lot of it's just research papers. Some of it's you know me making comments on various things and getting annoyed at people for writing stupid things. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter would be uh, my most active place. Okay, you got it. Well, I hear a crying baby in the background. I know you got to go. Correct. <laughs> so thanks again, Stefan, and looking forward to your talk with uh, Joe and Gary and looking forward to having you on again in the not too distant future. All right, thanks. Sounds good. That wraps up another episode of the Legendary Live podcast. And I hope you got a lot out of today's episode. We dived into some information. We took this conversation in directions that aren't the usual for my interviews with Stefan. I wanted to get a little bit deeper and talk about this climate that we live in and, and to try to understand what is going on here with our culture, with the obesity epidemic, and with this culture of information overload where nobody knows what to believe, nobody knows um, who's telling the truth, who really believes in what they believe in, but it doesn't happen to be true and why other people know, at least I, let's not use the truth, but what the best evidence says, but why they're not getting their message out there. So we got into that. You took a lot away from that. And by the way, just to remind you, I really appreciate everybody who's reached out to me and told me what they wanted more of on the podcast. So if you have some ideas, if you want to let me know how you thought about this episode and what you'd like to hear on this show in terms of topics, in terms of guests, reach out to me at legendarylifepodcast.com. You can literally go on my website and talk to me on the chat and leave me a message there. You can email me there. You can go to either Facebook or Instagram and find me at Ted Rice. That's T-E-D-R-Y-C-E. -E, and let me know what your suggestions for the show are. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter too, but I'm hardly ever on there. So it's really not the place. Go to uh, Facebook, Instagram, or to my website at legendarylifepodcast.com. Let's get this conversation started. Let's take podcast in a direction where 
it's serving you better and covering the topics, getting the guests on that you want to hear. That's how I've got. Hope you enjoyed this. Have an amazing week and I'll speak to you soon.